is Seeing Red. Now, in our 15th season of bringing you the best in independent Red Bulls news and opinion. Now, here are your hosts, Mark Fishkin and Joe Goldstein. Hello, hello, hello. It's Mark Fishkin flying solo today on a uh, international break window episode of Seeing Red. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, please like this show. Please subscribe to the show. We really appreciate your support. Um, this week on the show, it's an international week. The week before decision day, the Red Bulls are no longer in the running for a home field advantage slot in the MLS Cup playoffs. They're getting ready for a battle with defending MLS Cup champ Columbus Crew on the 19th. New York will face either Columbus or in-state rival Cincinnati in the first round of the MLS Cup playoffs. Meanwhile, uh, Jurgen Klopp has joined Red Bull Global Football as a senior advisor, strategic advisor. What will it mean for the New York Red Bulls, who have also a number of selections in the league season-ending awards? What are the chances that any Red Bull will win any award this year? We'll talk about it. Uh, We've got Steve Cangelosi, play-by-play voice for MLS Season Pass, on the show tonight with a uh, fantastic interview. And then, of course, your emails. Just me, Mark, flying solo. It's going to be a little bit of a shorter show. I don't want to talk about the loss in Atlanta. Don't want to talk about it. It's not going to do anything for anyone. We got job by the refs. New York didn't play terribly well. I think that's it. I think that's all I want to say about that. I think we're just going to talk about moving forward, and we're going to start off with playoff scenarios, and I really mean playoff scenario because New York is going to finish either sixth or seventh on the Eastern table. Uh, the the natural opponents for those slots, Columbus at the two and Cincinnati at the three, are also locked, meaning that if New York finishes seventh, they'll play Columbus. If they finish sixth, They'll play Cincinnati in a best of three. The Red Bulls will be home for game two of that best of three series. If you recall, or if you're new, which is totally fine, uh, that first round series goes to penalty kicks immediately if the score is tied after regulation. And a uh, regular season, a regular time win is worth worth exactly the same as a penalty kick shootout win. We know that the Red Bulls have lost their last four penalty kick shootouts. But we get all of a bit ahead of ourselves. So the scenario for New York on decision day is if they win, if they beat the Columbus crew and uh, Charlotte FC, which is one spot ahead of New York on the table, either loss, loses or draws against DC United, New York will move up to sixth and they'll play Cincinnati. In any other scenario, if New York loses or draws or New York wins and Charlotte wins, then New York finishes seventh, and they will face the team they play on the last day of the season for two more, at least, matches in the first round of the playoffs. Make sense? New York could have done themselves a solid, of course, by winning some games in the second half of the season. They spent most of the season in fourth place in the East, in which place <laughs> hell, they may play Orlando or they may have uh, faced up against New York City FC for the first ever Hudson Derby. Um, playoff series, but I mean, New York is kind of stumbling and bumbling their way across the finish line here. So again, it's really, really simple what has to happen on decision day if they want to avoid two more games against Columbus. And if you're Columbus, you've absolutely locked up second place. You can't move. You probably have a mix of regulars and subs playing in that match. Not that you ever want to lose a game, but, I mean, Columbus, even at half strength, is still pretty good. So we shall see what happens, and we'll preview that match during next week's Seeing Red. Um, Big move in in global football, the former iconic um, Dortmund and Liverpool manager Jurgen Klopp, who has stepped away from, uh, from the EPL, Found to uh, found a new role at Red Bull Global Football as a senior strategic advisor. And a lot of people have reached out to me and asked, what does that mean for the New York Red Bulls? And we're going to talk about it with Steve Cangelosi. And my answer is, I really don't think much. Don't think it means much. Are suddenly... Uh, different stars or a spending change or different youth development or 
um, more, better something going to necessarily happen for the New York Red Bulls because Jurgen Klopp is in this role? I, I don't really think so. If Jurgen can get Mario Gomez to throw more dollars at uh, our scouting department or our ability to bring in higher priced talent in addition to the youth development that they do, I mean, I, I think that's great. But I would hope that I hope that 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 Red Bull Global wouldn't need Jurgen Klopp to do that, right? I mean, this is this is the challenge for what we've seen this year that. New York tried and failed to go out and get a 20-year-old kid from the Polish second division, and that didn't work out. They brought in Felipe Carballo, who, to his defense, is not a like-for-like -like Frankie Amaya replacement, and so far is working his way into fitness and um, and wellness in with the team. And I, th I don't think it's necessarily correct to expect the same type of performance out of him being that he's still relatively new. And to be fair, it took Amaya a little bit to figure out his role on the team. So I know backing up Oliver Mintzlaff's comments about how MLS is not producing the type of talent that they would have hoped at this point in the project <laughs> that is the New York Red Bulls. I think the fact that I think the team is really leaning wholesale into the new training complex, which should open by the end of 25 or early 26. I'm thinking early 26. Pray for a mild winter, I guess. And so does Jurgen Klopp being on the payroll of Red Bull Global mean that New York is going to attract more young talent to be developed, to play for New York, to be transferred across the pond? I mean... If you're listening to Mintz laugh, that's what he wants. And if the team is competitive and wins a title, I think that's a positive externality that comes out of developing stars or young, young talent. But I do not think that that necessarily matters one bit to our owners. I think, you know, winning is nice, but I don't, necessarily think that that's top of mind for them at the end of the day. I don't think they are thinking every day about how a number of players under 30 are going to deliver an MLS cup to this fan base. I just don't. Do they want to win games? Sure. Are, you know, for the umpteenth time, are they willing to do anything possible to win? No, they are not. And New York is not alone among MLS clubs in having that challenge. They're just not. So, so the answer to the question, what does Jurgen Klopp mean to to the New York Red Bulls? I just don't think it means a whole lot. Sorry. Let's take a look at the year-end nominees for MLS awards. Um, there is a New York Red Bull nominated for just about every award category. It doesn't necessarily mean that all of those selections are going to be um, – in, in consideration among the finalists for these awards, voting is opening now. I do get a vote, which I, you know, it's really nice um, that I get to vote. Um, he, here are the awards that the Red Bulls are nominated for. Uh, Lewis Morgan is, is nominated for a uh, league MVP, the Landon Donovan MVP award. And while all of the Sturm and Drang over this award is, is Messi going to win this award? Because you know, Leo Messi grew up as a young boy in Argentina dreaming of winning the Landon Donovan MLS MVP award. Um, but in all seriousness, the the interesting wrinkle is that Mes uh, that Miami actually does does better statistically when Messi isn't in the lineup, which is terrifying. I don't know how you can give that award to a player whose team does worse when you're in the lineup. Nevertheless, Lewis Morgan, 13 goals and four assists, is in consideration and is nominated uh, by the Red Bulls for MVP award. He's not going to win it, um, and that's okay. I think that's totally okay. Coach of the year, Sandra Schwartz, as every coach is nominated for this award. Um, I think Schwartz has done a lot of things right. I think this play in the second half of the season would 
certainly indicate that that uh, Schwarz is not realistically a contender for this award, and I think that's all we can say about that. However, it's new. It's um, comeback player of the year, where Lewis Morgan, for my money, absolutely is a contender and should win. And yes, you know Robin Ludd in Minnesota. There are other contenders for this award, but for me, I mean, the Red Bulls would be absolutely up a, up a tree if Morgan wasn't back healthy and on this team. He, um, it, obviously, the entire team has suffered in the second half of the season. But in the first half of the season, he was blowing up. You could make the argument at one point that he, at, a, at on June first, could have been in the discussion for uh for comeback player of the year remember he missed just about all of 2023 with injury he's come back and he's been absolutely the man that the red bulls have needed him to be of course new york's needed a whole lot more but i think morgan with 13 goals has been uh and forest is absolutely phenomenal and i he's certainly going to get my vote for comeback player of the year um newcomer of the year emil forsberg is on this list he played only 18 times Going into decision day, he started only 14 times, seven goals and four assists. Yes, that's great for those games, but in a 34-game regular season, you're not going to win Newcomer of the Year playing barely more than half the time. And that's a shame uh, for everyone. And, of of course, if Forsberg had been healthy and present throughout the entire season, I think, um, yeah, there might be a consideration for Forsberg here. But not the case. Um, young player of the year, Daniel Edelman, who uh, played 30 times in the 33 games coming into decision day, started 25 times, uh, was named number 11 on MLS's annual shop window 22 under 22 awards. Hey, hey, global leagues, here's our young talent. Please, please come and buy it. Um I think a terrific honor for Edelman. Edelman has certainly had his detractors. One thing that you can't say about Edelman is that he doesn't uh, put 100% of himself into every time he plays on the pitch. He's still a relatively young player. He is a young professional, captain of the USU 20 team. Um, While he plays a very physical game and gives up the body every single time, um, certainly has suffered without Frankie Amaya playing next to him, I think in terms of his overall effectiveness. Um, he is absolutely a pit bull though. And it, it is a nice, it is a nice award, uh, number 11 on the 2222. And he is most likely not going to win young player of the year. One of the young Miami players, I think is likely to win that defender of the year. Noah Ayla has been nominated here, uh, has played 29 times, 27 starts, one assists. Uh, again, a nice, I think um, uh, uh, honor to be nominated for this award. I don't think, I mean, Ale has made some errors that any young player would make. The fact that he's not named to the 22 under 22 should tell you something here. Um, and I, I just think there's more to come w- when he returns next year. Could he be, uh, could he blossom into a young defender or a defender of the year candidate? Yes. Although I don't know if he'll be in MLS when he gets to that part of his development. And then lastly, goalkeeper of the year, Carlos Cornell is nominated for this award. Uh, 26 times he's conceded 41 goals. He did not stop a penalty kick in six tries this year. His goals against average is 1.59, only four clean sheets in 26 games played. Uh, and yet Cornell has made some phenomenal saves this year that has absolutely kept New York in games and would be incredibly missed when, if, and when he leaves the club. And he is up there with the longest tenured and best statistically ranked uh, Red Bull goalkeepers in the club's history. I don't believe that this is a year that he would seriously be under consideration for this award. Uh, You're not going to win MLS goalkeeper of the year with four clean sheets in 26 games. Pardon me, wetting my whistle. Uh, nevertheless, when we're back on seeing red and again, consider we'll, we'll get into the Columbus match next week on seeing red, but coming up next on the show is our good friend, Steve Cangelosi of MLS season pass. So keep it here, please. Thanks. Back on 
Getting ready the New York Soccer Roundup. Getting ready in advance for Decision Day about uh, about a week or so away. Very, very happy to have back on the show one of our favorite guests. That's Steve Cangelosi of MLS Season Pass. How are you, Steve? Doing well, Mr. Fishkin. How are you this morning? I, this, this season's gone by like a flash. I don't know how you feel. I felt like it was opening day like a few weeks ago. But here we are. Decision Day is uh, right in front of us on October 19th. It is both long and short. Yeah. Uh, it, it is a bit of a blur. At the same time, uh, at least for the Red Bulls, it's really been a tale of two halves of the season. Um, New York kind of comes limping, maybe not limping, but in into decision day with um, a, a pretty paltry record of success over the second half of the year. Yes, they're, they're happy to have Emil Forsberg back, um, but it hasn't yet equated to success on the field as of yet and now they come up against a very very tough uh opponent uh on decision day uh, columbus can actually select the red bulls for the first round of the playoffs mm -hmm. by beating them on the 19th the red bull arena and so i guess let's start here you know when, when you when you think about the the overall story of this 2024 red bulls team you know what are the overall themes that that you're uh, going to be thinking back on I think about 14 games played for ML4, or 14 starts, I should say, for ML Forsberg. And that number, if we were going to see the tangible success that we were told, or tangible improvement that we were told we would see this year, probably needed to be closer to 25. But injury and national team call-ups hold that back. I still think if you look at the body of work with him starting, the body of work without him starting, those tell two very different tales. And obviously, he was more front and center in this team in that first half of the season. I was disappointed with the game on Saturday night because I think a big finish going into the playoffs is somewhat important for this group in particular. I think it would be a good thing if they got their mojo back a little bit before they played the most important games of the year. Uh, the game in Atlanta was, how do I say this? There were probably six moments where critical calls could have gone either way. Yeah. And it seemed like the avalanche of them went against New York. With that said, you can't take that too much to the bank because Atlanta was probably the better team on the day and the result was probably justified for them. Uh, I would like to see them do something in the season finale against Columbus just to get a good vibe back. Nothing else, Mark. And uh, a little bit of optimism as they go play one of the Ohio teams, as you mentioned. And let's cut to the chase. Cincinnati for the Red Bulls is the opponent of choice. Yes. Not the alternative, the defending champions. No, for sure. And of course, we we kind of can go back to, I mean, the Red Bulls have been truly beaten down uh, only a handful of times. Mo most of the matches they've played have been very, very tight. They lead the league in draws. Um, they usually play it close, whether they they come out on top. But that early match at Columbus uh, in the first few weeks of the season, where the crew just eviscerated them, and uh, you know, I think I re recall Schwartz coming off the field saying that you know we we were beaten in every phase of the game. He he admitted that he had been beaten and. Um, to take nothing away from Miami. I mean, Columbus has been, you can argue, the the best team in the league through a lot of this season. Um, and in terms of playing for playoff position, they have nothing to do. Uh, they are locked into the second slot. Again, as I said earlier, by beating New York, they guarantee two more games against the Red Bulls um, in the playoffs, which is kind of a strange quirk of the schedule this year. We see that in the NFL every once in a while, where sure. a team in the last week of the season plays a playoff opponent. Um, I, I can't imagine Columbus will be hiding anything from New York from a tactical standpoint. Uh, they're, they're a better squad. And so if, if you're Schwartz and if you won't have, first of all, Kyle Duncan, who will, he's out for the season after a knee surgery, you won't have Dylan Nealis, who had picked up a red card in the uh, in the match in Atlanta? I mean, what what is really the objective here? Like you said, the goal is to just get the mojo back and feel good about what you're what you're doing on the field. I, I think this will be a good test for them going into the playoffs because I, I, look, I recently did a Columbus game where they changed over nine starters after the League's Cup final. Okay, right. 
And it was against Philadelphia, and Jim Curtin said, you know, their second 11 is a really good team. And I can see some version of that a week before the postseason begins happening, but you're still going to have a situation where Cucho comes off the bench probably and plays about 45 minutes in that game. You're still going to see contributions from Rossi, Ramirez. They're not going to wait two and a half weeks or three weeks to play meaningful soccer before the playoffs begin. So right. as far as the Red Bulls are concerned, look, even with the absences of Dylan Nealis and Kyle Duncan, I still think you put out a formidable 11, and I would like to see something close to a full 90 from ML Forsberg and something close to a full 90 with Forsberg, Morgan, and perhaps Van Zare playing together in advance of the playoffs to at least yeah. – you know, take a a, a a giant step forward in terms of chemistry for those three before the postseason begins. Um, they will be underdogs in Columbus. There's no way to otherwise rationalize it. They might even be a favorite against Cincinnati. When I split those two opponents, I think that's the simplest way to say it. They've played Cincinnati twice. They've beaten them twice. Some of the spice would be taken off a playoff series because Miazga's out for the year and Frankie Amaya for New York is long gone. But right. still, I, I think it would make for a very interesting tale should they meet again for a third consecutive postseason. Yeah, and you know, in order to get there, the Red Bulls would have to beat Columbus, and they need some yes. help from 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 other opponents. So you certainly can't count on it. Help from DC United, by the way. Sorry <laughs> to the old school fans, but this is one where you might want to toss any personal feelings aside. Yeah, I think the way the mojo has gone since June one, the notion of anyone helping New York do anything is <laughs> probably not in the cards. Um, th this week, obviously, a bit of an eyebrow raise throughout the the soccer world in. Uh, Jurgen Klopp, uh, former former teammate of Sandra Schwarz, uh, mm. taking a role at Red Bull Global Soccer. The fans in Dortmund are all upset. The fans of Liverpool are all upset. Um, I, I can certainly understand from Klopp's standpoint why this kind of a role would be really, really attractive. It's a global network of clubs. And uh, mm -hmm. on the heels of Minslaff's comments about MLS not producing quality talent, in a way that he had hoped. I'm curious, a, a lot of folks have asked me over the last week, what impact do you see Klopp coming to Red Bull Global Soccer having on the New York team? And I, I, my first thought was probably not a ton, but I'm curious to what you have to say. Okay, so the way the press release reads, and press releases read wonderfully when your team is doing well, yes. and they are met with skepticism when your team is in a little bit of a rut like the New York Red Bulls are going into the playoffs. So supporting the sporting directors to advance the Red Bull philosophy was front and center in <laughs> the press release by Red Bull Global. Look, I spoke with somebody who covers German football daily, who works in German football uh, on an almost daily basis. And I said, what is this about? And they have very familiar um, knowledge of how the inner workings of the German national team function, okay? And I said, what is he doing here? Is he just biding his time until around right. or shortly after the 2026 World Cup? he takes over the German national team to coach them moving forward. And that person told me, that's probably a good guess, but don't discount what he can do for all of the clubs that he will be connected with in the short term. Uh, from a New York Red Bull perspective, you know what I think would build a lot of goodwill to advance this notion that we do care about MLS and the New York team? I understand it's a network of clubs, okay? And I understand that RB, RB Leipzig is at the very top of that network. But when May comes around and yeah. the German season is done, it would be a very prudent move to see him at MLS games somewhere between 10 and 15 times a year, let's say between May and August before the next Bundesliga season begins, okay? Mm -hmm. I think that would be more than an act of goodwill. What's his function immediately for New York? The way it was described to me, and we'll know more as we approach January 1st and when he officially gets going with this job, is this is to make sure 
players will be slotted in the proper place. Think Caden Clark. Yeah. Did the Red Bulls handle that player perfectly? Far from it. <laughs> was Clark himself part of the problem? Yes, Absolutely, he yes. He was a young kid who needed to mature. And by the way, I'm happy to see him doing uh, better right now these days with Montreal. He's been a real player for them in recent weeks with Josef Martinez. But the idea of identifying talent outside the Red Bull universe and within the Red Bull universe to make sure we're doing everything we can do to get these players to reach the highest level of their potential. And there's probably a conversation in here about John Tolkien somewhere yes. that will be paramount. And it's not going to hurt to have one of the most influential soccer minds of the 21st century at the forefront of that. Sure. Sure. I think for Red Bull fans that are anticipating a massive change in any direction, I think with Klopp's arrival, um, I, I think are, are going to be, a little disappointed. I, I I agree with you that simply having him appear at Red Bull Arena yeah. will, will get fans excited. I think I think combined combining his appointment again with the Minslav comment, um, who also mentioned right the the, the new academy, uh, the new training complex, which should be opening at the end of next year or perhaps early in 2026. Um, they really see that, I think, as an opportunity to reboot the player development pathway here. Not to say that there aren't very talented youngsters who are playing at the academy and playing at Red Bull too, mm -hmm. and um, you know, starting to get first minutes um, with the first team. It's just, again, um, it's a lot of noise and a lot of excitement. I'm just not convinced that this is going to be meaningful in terms of New York improving necessarily its position on the on the MLS Eastern table. The only thing I could add to what you've just said is this. Uh, you know, you know, a lot of guys just need to press pause. They're they're burned out a little bit. We've seen that with great American coaches in other sports. Yeah. Okay. Uh, wh whether it's Dick Vermeil or anyone else, if you want to go way back, wow, that's yeah. that's a throwback. And that is a that is a callback. Yes, yes, audience. it is. But yes. uh, very few guys who are as committed to the craft as I believe Jurgen Klopp is can shut that down for any significant length of time. Yeah. And I guarantee you, there have probably been times over the last few months where he's been climbing the walls. He wants to stay <laughs> committed to what he said publicly, but there's part of him that's competitive and needs to be in the game on a day-to-day -day basis. But again, I, I don't want to just see him parachute in once or twice in the 2025 MLS season. Make this count. Get the transatlantic flights going. There will be pockets of your schedule where you can make that happen, whether it's at Red Bull Arena, where it's other avenues within MLS. I'm sure there'll be a lot of opportunities for him to travel the country. He's a smart guy. He's going to dive into the minutia of MLS. I think if he's been able to get the opportunity to do that and he'll spot talent elsewhere that maybe doesn't meet the eye immediately to right. a Jochen Schneider or a Julian de Guzman. That part of it remains to be seen. And frankly, I'd be excited about that part of it. But again, let's get him boots on the ground here in the United States before we go any further with this conversation. That's important. Fair enough. Uh, last thing I'll mention, um, it's a crazy sports time in New York right now. Yeah. I mean, both baseball teams in their league's championship series. Uh, I was riveted last night by the WNBA finals game one, uh, which New York wound up on the wrong end of the, the, you know, the New York Rangers started relatively well. The devils got two wins, uh, in Europe to start the season. Uh, a Knicks preseason game got a ton of attention, mm -hmm. um, and MLS is off this week with both of its teams headed to the postseason and yet um, not, not really making a dent with the understanding that with all that's happening right now, it's probably a bit of a challenge to get a, a bit of attention. Um, I'm curious. I mean, the, the, the league has been shut down for international breaks mm. for its entirety, but it just seems like during this so busy sports um, part of the, the calendar disappearing for a week, probably not great. It's far from perfect. Let's be frank. Okay. This is that week where I think the league really is in a tough spot. Okay. 
because I think they like to save this week for a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, it's an international break, and I don't think they want games of paramount importance to be played without so many people unavailable for these games. Now, it just so happens that Miami and Columbus are locked into their respective positions. What if they weren't? What right. if Messi was not available for a Miami game because he played for Argentina last night? Cucho is with Colombia. We can go on and on and on. Uh, and, you, you know, I, I think that the bigger thing to me is next month in the playoffs – where after the best of three series, there's, there's another, another international window yeah. following that third game on November 11th. That's where you press pause on momentum again. And I think that really takes some of the air out of the balloon, you know? Um, it, it, I, I think that this is something that we've been talking about for 25 years yes, as well. Right. Uh, and I don't know that there's an easy way around this unless MLS someday aligns itself with a different calendar. I don't know what they're doing next year, Mark. I really mean that. I know a lot of people inside the league, and I don't know how they're handling, let's just say, for instance, the Club World Cup. Are we right. looking at a three-and-a-half-week shutdown just for two teams, potentially, or maybe more than that? I don't know. The World Cup is coming in 2026. There has to be an adjustment to the schedule, I think, at some point, maybe as early as next year, to start shifting the calendar a little earlier so that you can open up time in July. These things are above my pay grade. It's not optimum. Um, yeah. And part of me in the next breath says, you know something, let others have the stage. I know the way it worked out, but there could have very easily been a Mets game five on Friday and a Yankees game five on Saturday. Right. We would save the headache from that. It is uh, what it is. Uh, and I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. Right. I don't have the answer to that. It's it's a very difficult spot for the league. You're right, though. It's far from perfect. It'll be really interesting what happens next year if the leagues are committed once again to, Le to Leagues Cup and again in 2026. Um, a, a lot of MLS stadiums have been selected for Gold Cup matches, for Club World Cup matches, uh, and the idea of somehow trying to either play through the Club World Cup I can't, I mean, as what we've seen in the past is the league will shut down for the, at least the group stage of mm -hmm. the World Cup. Yeah. But uh, what it means for U.S. Open Cup, which of course is a sensitive subject for a lot of fans, what it means for for any extra CONCACAF, it, it just, at some point, um, everyone's just got to take a deep breath, I think, and, and think a little bit out of the box. And I, I've been given no indication that League's Cup is going to go away for a year. None. Uh, in some way, shape, or form, it's my understanding that that tournament is coming back. Could we see a situation where there are two long pauses in the summer of 2025? I don't know. Uh, the schedule itself for League's Cup has been a point of contention for a lot of the managers in Mexico and a lot yes. of the players in Mexico. Yes. They, 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 they crashed out of the tournament. Club America even could not make a semifinal. There's a lot of discussion on how do we make this fairer for the Mexican teams, even though I think the tournament's going to stay predominantly or if not exclusively in the United States until further notice. Might there be a change in the calendar? Might we do this sooner rather than later? <laughs> Might we even do it in the late stages of winter? Is that A, more conducive to getting all these games in? And B, is it fairer to the Mexican teams who've played the first two iterations of this tournament while they're in preseason? All things to be determined. And uh, I, I've been around them long enough to know they keep a lot of things very close to the vest. <laughs> yes, they do. Well, listen, we appreciate you uh, spending some time with us as always. Uh, I know things are going to get busy again after this weekend for decision day and then the postseason. So we appreciate you making time. Thanks for coming by. Anytime. Take care. Awesome. We've got more seeing red coming up after this short break. Thanks.
Seeing Red, the New York Soccer Roundup. Thanks for stopping by, Steve. Hey, write us an email, won't you? SeeingRedNY at Gmail. Did not, uh, can't get to every email this week, and I apologize for that. Just me here. Next week, we'll have more. Friend of the show, back from the early days, Tobias Carroll says, Hello, Seeing Red. I just finished listening to the post-Hudson River Derby episode and the airing of frustrations there. I echo a lot of these frustrations, especially those having to do with the current season. It's taken a while for this to clarify in my brain, but here goes. Emil Forsberg is the first player of a certain scale who this team has had since energy drink soccer era began with the arrival of Jesse Marsh and Ollie Curtis. Maybe that helps explain what seems to be the biggest issue of the season. Investing in Forsberg was great, and I'm glad the club did it, but there doesn't seem to be anything remotely like a plan B if he's unable to play. And this season has suffered for it considerably. With Forsberg present early in the season, the Red Bulls look like a title contender. Without him, this team is a lot less impressive. And the lack of a plan B shocks me somewhat because, at least historically, both Hans Baca and Mike Petke had to have a plan in place to work around Thierry Henry's absence when playing on turf. I'm curious to hear what you think about this. Is Schwarz just dropping the ball? Is the answer less that Baca and Petke had a working plan B? And more that the team from 2010 to 2014 had other experienced veterans out there who could provide more leadership? Or does this further support Mark's point about the team needing more experienced players on board full stop? My tinfoil hat theory is that the front office fully expected they'd get Timo Werner in from Leipzig over the summer and were taken surprise when Spurs re-upped his loan. But I honestly don't know if there's anything to that one. Keep up the great work. Love the analysis on the podcast. That's Toby. Thank you, sir. As always, I mean, I, I think it's been a couple of things. I think it's been the idea that that Dante has not been the player that they wanted him to be in terms of goal production. I think that's a lot to do with it. I think it has to do with um, Lewis leveling up to such a point that now he's missing games on the regular in order to play for the Scottish national team in somewhat uh, – mop-up roles but nevertheless uh and he absolutely deserves to be playing for the national team of scotland for sure and then i think about like you said who's left to be the grown up on the field i mean is it sean nealis um it's hard to be on the back line and drive everything from there right and and yes this team from 2010 to 2014 when Henri wasn't here you know, there were there were guys like Dax McCarty, and there were guys who took the mantle of leadership to drive the team forward, even when Henri wasn't there, and the team had different levels of talent. Um, and the argument that you know a Cam Harper and a Dennis Yengar and a Daniel Edelman and a Noah Isla. And, uh, you know, even a Dylan Nealis and a Frankie Amaya, I mean, these these are young players. And to have, as we heard from Forsberg when he spoke to the press a few weeks ago, like, you've got to be nasty out there. You've got to have an edge. And you've got to get into your teammates a little bit. You know, is John Tolkien that guy that's going to be yelling at his teammates if they don't do something right? I mean, I don't, I don't know if a that's necessarily part of his gig. Although he certainly could, given the amount of time he spent with the team, you know. But Coronel and or Sean Nealis, it's difficult from back there to make sure things work. I mean, not Timo Werner coming to the Red Bulls, I to New York, I think would have been um, the kind of player that. I think the team desperately needs. I, I don't. I don't think that's being, um, you know, somewhat controversial. I mean, a a, t a player of Timo Werner's um, stature and just experience, even though he hasn't always been successful where he's gone. I mean, that would have been phenomenal. So. Thank you so much, Toby. Here's Tom Malone. Hey, Mark, and guest host. Nope, just me. Now that the regular season's coming to a close, what would you say is the bare minimum needed to bring this team from a basic playoff-making team to an MLS Cup contender? Is it a roster change, a coaching change, maybe triple the investment into Red, our new mascot? 
I'm by no means an expert, but I think it requires two changes. The first and obvious is a roster change. We need a more consistent front line. I know everyone screams we need a nine and a certain point. I agree. Maybe that is the only missing piece. Believe it or not, I was actually hoping for a DP central midfielder in the last transfer window. Someone that could connect the defense and the forwards with a little more creativity. We've seen how that works with ML. As of now, I think Edelman is fine, but having an elite midfielder right in the middle of the field who can defend and cut passes out like Dax McCarty and also has the ability to execute the killer pass forward would completely unlock this team. Also, maybe starting Cam Harper a bit more, please. The guy is scoring off the bench, drawing penalties, and just seems too good to sit behind Yengar. The second change I would incorporate would be tactically. We used to press so ferociously all the way to the opponent's goalkeeper, and that used to award us so many good chances or an easy clearance to win us possession. However, this year we seem to only aggressively press the ball once gets to midfield or if it's pushed into wide areas. Defenders and goalkeepers under stress are typically much less composed on the ball and more prone to mistakes, and yet we seem to rarely put real pressure on them. Even teams like NYCFC are now pressing us. Energy drink soccer is now starting to look a little bit more like sleepy time tea. Wow, from the top rope, Tom. So here are the changes I would propose. What about you? What's the minimum amount it would take to push this team to a top-of-the-table contender? Thanks for all the content. I'll go out of my way to like YouTube videos and show my support. Thank you. And also subscribe. The subscribing piece cannot be underestimated. So, you know, first of all, I, I think that, uh, to Tom's comment, I think Edelman is really... You know, when Dax played, it was a three-man midfield with Dax, the defensive single point. Felipe was a little more forward, and uh, Sasha was, you know, was the attacking distributor. Um, I think that Edelman is not Dax for sure, for sure. I think he's just a different kind of player. He's different physicality to him. Although he certainly, as I said earlier, throws his body into every play. I, I, he's just not the same player. And that's okay. Uh, Harper and Yengor, we've heard Schwartz say that these players are somewhat similar. And I think it's fair to say that Harper, uh, depending on the week, is, has seen the field before Yengor. So I'm not, I don't think it's correct to say that he is behind him on the depth chart. Although I think we'll definitely see Harper play right back against Columbus, given the fact that both um, Kyle Duncan will be out recovering from injury and Dylan Nealis will be out with a red card. So keep that in mind. Um, I mean, a DP central midfielder. I mean, I think you've got one right now. Well, you've, you've got two, right? You've, you've got um, Carballo who is in essence, the Felipe role moving a little bit forward, more of a traditional eighth and a six, and if Carballo can figure it out with Forsberg and Morgan and Van Zier, then things are working in terms of the attack. Um, I think you're saying you would like to return to a full court, a full field press all the time. Uh, I think that it is true that that has changed so far this year. I um, it'll. I think in the right situations. New York will go there, but I think it's important to be able to possess the ball a little more. And that's what we've seen over the last couple of years. So I don't necessarily have a hard time with it. What I do have a hard time is an attack that looks very similar to previous years in this interregnum since 2019, where the ball just simply gets cycled from left to right uh, and death by a thousand crosses without a decisive pass on the ground, breaking lines once you get to the opponent's attacking third. Don't like it. All right, last email, first time writer, I believe, is uh, Omar Bajwa, or Bawa, and excuse me on your last name. I'm going to call Bajwa for now. Please let me know if I've messed up, and my apologies if I do. With a really nice email that I really like the spirit of what's said here. Mark, first and foremost, sending my love and support to Joe. Yes, yes, wishing you all the best. I'd like to bring up a topic that's always in the back of my mind. How can we make the experience at Red Bull Arena uh, at Rebels games, as fun as possible when we bring casual fans and first-time fans along with us as guests. I've had many instances where I brought friends, neighbors, family members who do not follow the team 
very much to the stadium with me. I'd like to turn more of my friends and family into more consistent fans of the team. And here are things that I try to do. I'm curious to hear if you have other recommendations. First, I try to buy tickets that are close to the field so my guests can really see and feel the game more so than they would in other New York, New Jersey sporting events. Often this ends up being one of the corner sections. Even the angle is technically not ideal. I find this makes for a fun and unique experience. Next, I try to show more fun and interesting food and drink places with them, Brisas, Empanadas, South Ward, Ale, Beer, etc. Lastly, I try not to. I try to not nerd out too much when describing each of the players, their tactics, their skills. I assuming it's probably annoying to hear a hardcore fan drone on about minute details in the game. My question for you is what other things do you think we can do to help casual guests have fun and want to come back again? How can we be the best ambassadors we can? Thanks for all you do. I love the show. Keep up the great work. That's Armor. Armor, th th that is a great email. I mean, that is the essence of what this show tries to do take casual fans into fervent fans and fervent fervent fans into season ticket holders and keep in mind the team has to do some stuff here too to play an exciting brand of soccer that makes people want to come back so consider that however um you know, I would offer, and I am biased here because um, fans may or may not know, I sit in the front row of Section 201, which is above the South Ward and in the center of the stadium in the second deck, and it really allows you to see how the plays come together. And for guests that may be either new to soccer or new to the Red Bulls, having a higher vantage point to allow fans to see how formations come together and who is playing where and what New York is doing technically is interesting. I would think it'd be interesting even to say, so for instance, when New York is oppressing, I always, and I sit around long time knowledgeable fans, but to note that, you know, there are times where 10 New York's 10 field players will all be in the attacking half of the field. And what does that do? And why is that important? And why aren't they sitting back? Um, there are times to see how the opponents are playing incredibly narrowly where um, they're trying to compress the field or they're playing a little bit more or watching when a ball is won and a player makes a run down the opposing half and, and to hit long balls, um, things like that. I often say with fans that are new to the team, like pick one player, like it's easy to follow the ball, right? When you're watching soccer, but to maybe say, Hey, just watch what John Tolkien does for the next two or three minutes, regardless of whether or not he has the ball, you know, where is he stepping? When is he dropping? When is he engaging? Does he, is he in, when does he get involved in the offense or watch a Forsberg? What does he do when he doesn't have the ball? Right. Or right. Famously, someone like Messi, who spends the first half of the game just literally walking around the field, looking at the defensive shape and seeing where the holes are. That's kind of the maybe the best example of that. Um, I'm all for more fun and interesting food and drink places. I think that's great. I would try them some uh, invite them somewhere different every time. Hey, we did this this time. Let's do somewhere else this time. Um, I think there's a way to nerd out without it being drony, right? I would answer questions. I would hope, uh, you know, your friends and family that you bring would ask questions rather than just sit there absorbing the game. And it's okay to be an expert there. But I would just say, hey, you know, if you're new to the game, you might want to consider just doing this for the next few minutes. Um, and of course, being a good ambassador for casual guests means looking at the future, uh, the next games to be like, oh, look, there's another game coming up in two weeks or three weeks. You know, let me know if you want to come. Um, I would ask them, what are they enjoying about the experience? Like, what do they think? What do you think? Tell me. Tell me what's fun about this. Maybe the answer is there's nothing fun. Maybe the answer is... <laughs> The second half of the season has been a total drag and I'm not happening and I don't want to come back, but never, but, but I think it's important to, to be positive and, um, show them, teach them a little bit about why things are happening or 
depending on where you're from around the area. Hey, uh, you know, this young player, he's from this town that happens to be near us. But nevertheless, a terrific email, Amr, and I really appreciate your writing. Uh, we've come to the end of Seeing Red 591. Thanks to Steve Cangelosi for dropping by. We will be back next week to preview the Decision Day match against Columbus. We miss you, Joe Goldstein. Um, uh, thank you again for watching. Uh, please like, please subscribe. As I said, uh, we'll be back next week. Thank you so much. Have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye.